Hi, good afternoon, everyone. Thank you so much for joining our session this afternoon on reimagining student engagement. We're really excited to be here and talk to you all a little bit more about revamping school policy and practice uh, and fostering student advocacy um, as we transition to school in fall. My name is Christina Quintanilla Munoz, and I am one of four education policy fellows here at IDRA. I earned my Bachelor of Arts in Psychology from the University of Texas at San Antonio and recently earned my Master's of Education in Educational Psychology with a specialization in quantitative methods from the University of Texas at Austin. And I'm currently a doctoral student at UTSA in Applied Demography. So I did bring excessive background in psychological research and experience in student mentoring to my fellowship experience, which really set the tone for my approach to my advocacy. And during my fellowship, I focused on policy areas such as digital equity, student mental health and wellness, and student engagement in my research and advocacy work um, to ensure Texas policymakers responded equitably to educational impacts by the COVID-19 pandemic. All right, so I'm joined this afternoon by my brilliant colleagues, Thomas Marshall, Education Policy Fellow and newly announced Policy Communication Strategist at IDRA, and Melivia Mujica, IDRA Education Practice Intern and Student Advocacy Extraordinaire. So I will turn it over to each of them to introduce themselves and share a bit about their work here at IDRA. Yeah, thanks so much, Christina. Um, hello, everyone. Good afternoon or good morning, depending on where you are. Um, my name is Thomas Marshall. Really excited to be here today to be able to present on reimagining student engagement. Um, just like Christina said, I'm an IDRA Education Policy Fellow, a part of our really cool inaugural Policy Fellows of Color program. We are able to get people of color that represent the communities that we advocate for and plug us in right into the policy state level experience. So it was a really, really great, tremendous fellowship. Um, I also am from Columbia, South Carolina originally, and I graduated with a BA in English with a minor in Youth Development Studies from Clemson University. Um, and currently, I'm a graduate student at the Department of Education, Leadership, and Policy Studies at the University of Houston, studying to obtain my master's in education. Um, so I'll pass off to Melinda next. Hello everyone, my name is Melivia Mujica. I am a junior at Texas A&M Kingsville. I am a double major in environmental engineering and political science. Um, I have worked with, I have been an intern with IDRA for two years now. Um, I specialize in student advocacy, something that I have been doing since I was in high school. Um, and to this day, I still participate in student advocacy at my university, um, yeah. Thank you so much. Yeah, before we get started, we just want to turn your attention uh, to the chat panel on the right hand side. Um, there you can feel free to utilize this chat to introduce yourself, where you're from, where you're tuning in from, and what organization you represent. Also, there's a Q&A section for any questions you would like us presenters to address uh, following our presentation at the end. Um, so again, please feel free to utilize that throughout our presentation. So I'll turn it over to Thomas to get us started. Absolutely. So I'm going to be going over our agenda really quickly. Um, so today we're going to be reimagining student engagement, uh, thinking about how we can best center students in our policy and advocacy work, along with a lot of the work that we've been able to do uh, over the past nine months working at IDRA and Christina. Um, we come into this work as advocates, meaning that we leverage relationships with students, school district leaders, and educators to advocate with legislators to write policy that positively affects student experience. Today, we're going to be going over a couple areas and we separated them into four quadrants. Um, so first, we'll examine various Texas policy solutions that we advocated for during our legislature. Secondly, we'll talk about how we facilitate student conversations around the impacts of COVID-19. Thirdly, we'll hear from Olivia about student advocacy and how advocates can better support students in their own self-efficacy. Um, and lastly, we'll be speaking about what are the ways that you can begin to develop authentic student and family engagement models and how those models can really inform the work that we do. Um, so I'll pass it off to Christina to start to lay the groundwork and get us started. So 1.4 million, this is the statistic of students during the 2020-21 school year um, that U.S. public schools lost during that year. And this was um, a report that Education Week put out this year um, through the analysis of state data that estimated this statistic. Um, so in general, this was a widespread devastating loss um, that disproportionately impacted students of color, students from families receiving low incomes, emergent bilingual students, 
students and those impacted by the digital divide. And according to the most recent data by the National Center for Education Statistics, at least 11 million students don't have a computer for online learning at all. So in addition to those that may need to share a single device with siblings, these effects are compounded. Um, so, so as you can see, the lack of access to home internet or a computer increases for lower income students and really affected this statistic here. The next slide shows um, another statistic. So one in 10. In October 2020, the Texas Education Agency reported that Texas public schools lost one out of every 10 students at the start of the COVID pandemic during the tr transition to remote learning. And TEA also reported that schools lost touch with Black students and Latinx students at over twice the rate of white students. So these two statistics really resonated with me throughout my advocacy work as a fellow and in thinking about how the COVID-19 pandemic exacerbated inequity, inequities within the K through 12 public education system. And as we all know, the dramatic shift to remote online learning strained these inequities that already existed um, in school funding, technological resource access, connectivity, um, and certainly the ways that schools engage families. So this was especially true for districts that serve large populations of students of color, uh, emergent bilingual students, and students from households with low incomes. So that being said, the topic of student engagement really became the lighthouse to our work in thinking about how the Texas legislature um, especially could support schools and key personnel such as teachers, administrators, and mental health professionals in responding equitably to these issues and ensuring families and students were best supported throughout this unprecedented period. And in the next slide, you can see um, kind of a, a bit about our research. So in many parts of Texas, um, we found diminished student engagement was a re direct result of limited internet access during the transition to remote learning. And so in May of this year, IDRA released an issue brief um, that Thomas and I actually worked on titled Plugged In, Tuned Out in which we explore student engagement patterns in Texas public schools at the start of the pandemic. So a little bit of background information, the PEAMS crisis codes or the Public Education Information Management System crisis codes developed by the Texas Education Agency characterize student engagement as completion of assignments, responsiveness to teacher and school outreach and participa participation in uh, virtual classrooms by logging on. So TEA's definition of student engagement, as you can see for this purpose, is narrow uh, and places the onus on students and their families rather than me measuring a school's role and engaging students in the classroom in the first place. So according to the PEAMS code, students completing assignments in one or more content areas are counted as engaged if they are responding to teacher or school administration outreach. So students who respond to this outreach but do not complete assignments were coded as unengaged. So schools report student engagement across instructional venues such as on-campus learning and remote learning and both synchronous and asynchronous methods. So in order to explore how the digital divide impacted student engagement during the pandemic, IDRA examined the relationship between student engagement patterns in spring 2020 and access to broadband internet services prior to the pandemic across Texas school districts. And we studied three uh, research questions. One, what is the pandemic's impact on students' public school enrollment? Second, what is the relationship between district size and student engagement patterns across Texas school districts during the 2019-2020 school year when the COVID pandemic hit? And third, what is the relationship between broadband internet access and student engagement patterns? So the last research question is really what we want to explain kind of as the focal point of our efforts in our student engagement research and advocacy during our fellowship. So IDRA studied data on student engagement patterns from the spring 2020, spring 2019, excuse me, 2020 school year, paired with an analysis of Texas students broadband access from the U.S. Census Bureau uh, 2019 American Community Survey five year estimates that looked at the presence and type of internet subscriptions in households within Texas school districts. And the final analysis of this data demonstrates that broadband internet access was actually a significant predictor of full student engagement for larger, more urban school districts. So what does this mean? So the main takeaways from this research were, number one, that the digital divide continues to impact education and widen the homework gap, meaning schools can serve as a leader in aiding their students and families to overcome such barriers through student engagement initiatives. 
And so as we know, many schools adopted critical strategies during the pandemic to improve students' overall learning experience through online instruction, such as the issuing of hotspots and computer devices. However, as many schools transition back to traditional in-person classroom models this fall, we as educators, scholars, and advocates must consider more viable long-term solutions that work to address these barriers and seek to bridge the divide. And second, standards of student engagement really developed by state education agencies, as you can see here, are often very narrow. And so again, we must consider the engagement of students as an indicator of a quality school. And I did want to turn the attention to IDRA's Quality Schools Action Framework, and hopefully um, either Malivia or Thomas can drop more information about that that you can access on our website. But based on this framework, um, IDRA identifies school engagement based on a school environment and activities that value students and incorporate them in the learning process and other uh, social activities within the school. So a quality school, including high academic achievement as an outcome, really depends on a school's engagement of students. And lastly, student engagement is a quite complex, nuanced construct that is comprised of various facets of the student's experience at school, as we may know, including academic self-efficacy, feelings of motivation, connect connectedness to or safety in their school and classroom environment. So schools really must consider sustainable solutions to addressing these aspects of engaging students to ensure that they are well supported and not just academically, but emotionally as they return to school in the fall. And as fellows and interns, we wanted to figure out the most effective ways to leverage our expertise as advocates and, and students to promote viable asset-based solutions to this engagement issue um, focused and faced by many school districts in our state uh, during the pandemic. So I'll pass it right now to Thomas, who kind of will walk you through a lot of our policy work um, during our fellowship related to these ideas that really stemmed from the research. Thank you so much, Christina. And yes, we'll drop that link in the chat right now pretty soon. We're just having some trouble copying and pasting the link, but we'll be able to get you the quality schools action framework. So you're able to take a look at that. Um, but yes, I am really excited to um, um, be able to present on the policy side of things. Um, it informed a lot of our work throughout the Texas, like, Texas legislative session, a lot of those research and briefs that Christina was able to help produce. Um, and I wanted to just give a brief outline first off about the Texas legislator and how the government structure works in our state, just in case you may not be familiar. Um, so similar to other states, we have a bicameral legislator, which is basically just a fancy word for saying that we have a House and a Senate. And every two years for the first five months of the year, they meet to write the various laws that will affect our current and distant future for all Texas students. So there's a couple of committees that write most of the education bills on the House side. It's called the Public Education Committee. And on the Senate, it's the Education Committee. Each has thousands of education bills coming through the legislator's desk, but only a handful end up being passed. Due to the COVID-19 pandemic and the political climate in Texas, it was going to be a hard session um, for a lot of those education bills that we know um, nationally and not just here in Texas, that there were a lot of issues that needed to be solved um, from COVID-19 and some things that need to be addressed within state legislators. Some of the main policy ideas that we advocated for at the Texas Capitol this year included the Crown Act, a student and family engagement plan, plans for a student experience study, digital inclusion and digital citizenship, as well as student mental health and wellness. As a side, the, as I said before, the pandemic made things really difficult for students to access the capital safely um, and be able to testify on some of this legislation that directly affects them. So to give you a Texas policy update, I'll start with the Crown Act. Um, so I'm sure many of you have already heard of the Crown Act. It was originally introduced as legislation in California, but has now made headlines across the nation. Um, this version was a school specific one and would prohibit discrimination in school dress and grooming codes um, and prevent schools from discriminating against and punishing students who wear hairstyles that are commonly or historically connected with race. We all know discrimination in the policing of black students here and dress code has been a problem for years. This isn't new information. Still, many black students in Texas schools experience this bias and punishment for wearing hairstyles that are inappropriately prohibited by the school district's code of conduct. There's a lot of students that have received suspensions and other really harsh punishments just for expressing themselves um, and being true to their own cultural heritage. There's a lot um, of school districts that have tried to legislate this as a local level um, through their own dress codes, which is progress. Um, but Texas had the opportunity to implement this statewide, which would have been so important for many black students and especially black girls who are disciplined at a disproportionate rate than almost every other group. Um, 
Also, to, to turn to things, we also helped author a student and family engagement plan. Um, you heard Christina talk about this, and you'll hear her talk about it even more in depth later. Um, but this plan was a really important step in a response that um, we had with many conversations with school leaders, students, and educators, and families about how do we positively affect the school experience outside the classroom. Um, this bill would have assisted Texas school districts with achieving high levels of family involvement in schools with a collaboration of stakeholders. Um, so we're talking students, school leaders, families, the teachers in the classroom. These plans really would have sought to create high levels of student engagement and parental involvement and also help school districts meet the unique needs of each community. Um, and how do we extend resources going on through the COVID-19 pandemic? Um, like Christina said, to the TEA or the Texas Education Agency um, showed that we lost one in 10 students during the pandemic. Um, those reports at the end of spring 2020 showed that almost 89% of students were fully engaged at the time of COVID-19 school closures, um, but those numbers were still visible once school ended last year. And lastly, um, we also have a bill called the Student Experience Study, which really would have been an amazing bill um, that would have formally and actually legally recognized students as partners in the design and implementation and success of their own education. It also would have commissioned a statewide study of the student experience and required um, the Texas Education Agency to train school district leaders how to authentically use student feedback with students and not for students. This bill was actually specifically co-created with students um, and some of the folks at Leadership ISD here in the Fort Worth area of Texas and would have made strides for how we recognize students as partners, as policymakers in the room, um, not just taking their input at the seat at the table. So it really would have been a huge thing um, for students to work on. Next, we'll go to student mental health and wellness. Um, so there are a lot of bills tailored toward this. Um, and so for student mental health and wellness, this is a lot of the work that Christina was able to do over the legislature. Um, and one of the goals of a particular bill was to have at least 80% of school counselors' time be dedicated to delivering a comprehensive school counseling program according to school district standards. Um, we already recognize that school counselors have so much on their plate um, already. And so this bill was an important step, we thought, in supporting students as well. Um, and I actually want to bring Christina into the conversation. Is there anything that you would like to add to, to some of the student mental health illness, uh, wellness bills you were able to try? Definitely. So IDRA really worked in conduction and in collaboration with um, many mental health professionals and mental health advocates during the legislature. And this represents um, a huge win, I think, for um, these initiatives, especially when we're thinking about access to these really critical student mental um health services when students kind of transition back to school. Uh, and so really, really um, appreciative that the Texas legislature um, passed this bill. Um, and like I mentioned before, this is a really critical part as engaging in, in students. It's not just their academic well-being, um, but it's also their emotional well-being um, as well. Absolutely. Um, so really great work was done on those bills. Um, so lastly, of all the bills, there were a couple important ones that surround the digital citizenship, um, which refers to an individual's ability to find, identify, and evaluate, and apply information using technology. Um, this bill specifically would have required students to take a class on digital citizenship during their sixth grade year, um, and would have included really cool ways of understanding misinformation, um, as we know, during the ever-changing internet landscape. Um, the other bill, um, which is on the digital inclusion side of things, um, was to make sure that everyone is able to participate in our society digitally. Um, and that happened through the HB5, which is this huge, big broadband access bill. Um, it basically would incentivize companies to build broadband networks in some of those underserved areas of Texas and also create a grant program. So entities like hospitals or even schools would be able to apply for this funding to be able to get broadband networks to their communities. Um, it's a step, but we also recognize that there's a lot more local work that needs to be done to identify the gaps in access um, because a lot of students were able to gain access to hotspots um, and Wi-Fi towers, but we know we need a more robust, high-quality internet, um, reliable connection for our students and families. So really quickly, we're going to fuse the side of policy and community engagement together and talk about some of the things we were able to do on the community engagement side that informed a lot of our policy. Um, so, um, a part of the first portion in the slide that you'll see, we held an event called Texas Student Advocacy Convening, a really impactful night where we were able to facilitate discussions with high school and college students about their experiences with COVID-19, the effect that it's had on their schooling, um, all the way from not having a say into their curriculum to internet connection problems um, and so much more. Um, there was so much that students had went through that we really were able to bring to light that. 
After learning about a lot of these issues, we continue to do this work um, with some of these students that eventually helped some students write testimony on different bills um, and used a lot of those policy ideas that we talked about that night to inform our work that we did throughout the legislative session. Um, on the bottom of this slide, you'll see that we also had testimony um, and our different staff members at IDRA um, worked with students um, and were able to have them testify on different bills and write public comments um, to some of the digital inclusion bills that um, I spoke about a bit earlier and offer their stories how they were affected by internet issues over the pandemic. So as you'll see, there's a quote that you can read on the screen um, from a student that talked about some of his struggles um, with digital inclusion, being able to be connected to the internet. And I just wanted to add that this experience um, during the student advocacy convening was not just cathartic, it was so um, intentionally curated by our students. Um, and so Thomas was an incredible facilitator of, of the conversation, but really students led and spearheaded um, the, the kind of discussions about all of these um, policy areas or issues that students wanted to talk about. Uh, and so students brought such creative and innovative solutions to the discussion um, that really demonstrated why their voices are so important to uplift in this work. And so now I kind of just want to pivot over and have that kind of conversation and engage Olivia a little bit in her experiences working as a student advocate and just kind of ask if you can share a bit about your experiences um, as a student advocate and how might school leaders or educators begin to develop those relationships of, of trust with students so that uh, policy recommendations are informed not just for the students but by the students. So just to talk a little bit about that, um, <clears throat> on my experience, um, in order to get the students to advocate about this, uh, their concerns and to have um, policy work done by, uh, for the students by the students, you need to create a safe space for them to be able to bring up what they need to talk about. Um, personally, what happened with me was, um, uh, what ended up happening is that, you know, lunch is a very, hard time for students to socialize. Um, me as an introvert, I did not like it at all. So I would go to one of my favorite teachers um, classroom to eat lunch there. And more and more students started coming that felt like outcasts that felt that they didn't fit in in the school that felt that they didn't belong in the school. And it got to a point where we started talking about like, oh, I don't like this about school. Oh, I don't I don't think this is right. Or I heard a teacher make this comment and I don't really understand. And, it, and when it started going and it started kind of snowballing into an effect of us bringing up all our concerns, uh, ranging from just like AP students to uh, uh, CT students, career, techni career technical pathway students, like everything, all that. And we ended up getting their concerns and our teacher was actually able to give us the spark of telling us that, you know, um, just because we're students doesn't mean we can't do anything about it. I mean, we we have a change, we have a voice. And if the concerns are coming straight from us and not from parents, then that makes a bigger effect and it creates more, um, a, a bigger domino effect into uh, the, the administration or the teachers to change what they're doing and to get the change that we wanted to see. Yeah, and I was also hoping you can kind of explain a little bit more about how, like, the practical strategies for educators to serve as stronger allies to students um, who are really trying to promote their student advocacy initiatives and what that could look like. So in order to have teachers, you have to create a safe space. And when I mean a safe space, I don't mean like just have students to be comfortable there in your classroom. They have to be comfortable with you to talk about things that they don't normally talk about. You know, um, it has to be a point of communication and um, respect between each other. It's not that, oh, I see the teacher higher than me. The teacher is at my level. He went, he or she went through the same things as I did and he or she can help me. So the biggest thing is, is that you have to relate to other students. So one thing that really sparked for us is we played a game called uh, uh, an icebreaker called stand up. And it was kind of like stand up if one one or 
one or both of your parents are immigrants and kind of like that. And once we started seeing those connections between us and the other students, we kind of realized we had a lot in common. And the, even the teacher participated and we realized, wow, you know, instead of seeing it as an adult figure, we're seeing it as an equal and realizing they went through the same stuff as we did. And once we did that, they were able, you have to be unbiased and you have to give them the framework to do what they want to do in regards to mental health, in regards to disciplinary actions at the school, in regards to LGBTQ, um, all that within the school. If you if the student wants to change that, you have to give the student framework and be unbiased. You just give the student the space and the information they need so they themselves can do these things. I really appreciate how you mentioned like kind of putting students in the role of the leader, right? And so I'm wondering if you can share a little bit with participants about how school leaders, educators, advocates like myself, um, how we can combat adultist tendencies that might stifle student voices. And it, it simply um, can be just that we're unaware of our larger, um, older voices that uh, we kind of sometimes forget that it's not our initiative and but we can serve as a supporting role. So I was wondering maybe some practical strategies we can keep in mind when we're combating adultist tendencies. Um, my biggest thing is just to listen. Listen to the students. If anything, bring up questions, but don't bring up um, your point of view. You want to be unbiased and as clear as possible so the students have are able to bring up their concerns and not have any bias because it's sad, but it's true. But adult figures in our lives are the ones that kind of, you know, steer us into whatever pathway we're thinking of. Or, you know, they can kind of over overbear us with information that we don't really thought about or we weren't thinking about. And it kind of changes our point perspective. Um, so what we can do is we can just listen to them, create a space where students are able to just communicate with themselves. And the only thing us as adults that we're doing or facilitators is that we're listening and we're writing down what concerns they're bringing up the most. And in that way, we can create a space where students are more than likely going to flourish and bring up concerns and do something about those concerns. I really appreciate you being able to share your insight, Olivia, as a student and as a former student uh, advocate in your own uh, space in high school. Uh, and so thank you so much for sharing those practical strategies. And so I kind of want to pivot over uh, some of the critical objectives that um, we focus on when thinking about how to sy systematically engage students and their families. Again, like Olivia mentioned, laying the groundwork that um, really allows families and students, most importantly, to be at the center of those conversations is, is one key, um, key objective for family engagement plans. So in Thomas's and my advocacy research, um, and this was through meetings with community members, um, including school district leaders, educators, mental health professionals, students, um, and other advocacy partners. But in addition to um, some of the research projects that we worked on, uh, we just developed a framework, a, a really basic framework that would be served for robust student family engagement plans that school districts could adopt. And I know Thomas previewed uh, a little about this um, earlier in the presentation, but we actually were able to craft bill language uh, for a bill HB 4391 that was filed this Texas legislative session uh, by Texas House Representative James Tallarico, which outlines uh, many of the ideas we are sharing with you this afternoon. So I do wanna point out that while these ideas, um, definitely along with many other important initiatives to address student access to mental health services, digital literacy um, and the widening achievement gap for students of color, emergent bilingual students and students from families receiving low incomes. School districts don't have to wait uh, for state leadership to implement these effective strategies aimed at um, increasing family involvement and student engagement. So this is exactly why we're sharing these um, strategies with you this afternoon. Efforts to promote youth and adult partnership in education must continue to create accessible pathways for engagement and encourage positive relationships with students, community members, and schools. So I guess I'll turn your attention now to this um, model here and just kind of walk through some of the critical objectives in engaging 
students and their families. So first and foremost, the idea is to achieve and maintain high levels of family involvement and positive family attitudes towards education, which we saw a lot of that compromise during COVID when there were a lot of access issues during um, uh, online learning, remote instruction. And so this is really important is re-engaging families in that way, but establishing those positive family attitudes towards learning um, and trust for the school. Second, strengthening relationship between students, families, and teachers. The main network of support system for your students. Um, it's, it's very critical that these be part of the student family engagement efforts. Uh, third, as I mentioned before, student engagement is a very nuanced construct. And so plans um, to engage families must consider that they should serve to develop students' sense of belonging and connection to their learning environment, not just them as the learner. Uh, so the, these plans must promote students' academic motivation and achievement, but also emotional well-being. Uh, fourth, another critical objection, uh, objective is to create opportunities for parents to engage and be directly involved in their students' education. Uh, during COVID, families and um, parents were were second teachers and um, in their students' online learning. Um, so it's really important that we engage them in the process and engage them in um, being involved in their students' education. Fifth, creating a communal campus environment. So this means branching that network between students, families, teachers, district leaders, and community-based organizations. So ensuring that community members and leaders are brought into this process as well creates a, a more um, healthy, holistic experience for the student. And then six, identifying and addressing key concerns about education expressed by student, family, and community. So on the next slide here, I wanted to turn your attention to some practical strategies that student family engagement plans at your school or your district could include. So the first would be to establish a robust system of two-way communication between school and families. And this should include multiple modes of communication, right? So a lot of the time uh, engagement models in our research were found to be one way the school almost talking at families, talking at students um, as a means of engaging them in whatever um, initiatives or projects or programs that the school was leading, but instead a, an engagement plan should really focus on a two-way communication system in which families and students are able to uplift their concerns to the school. And this should be through a multiple means of communication. So whether that looks like online or taking the time to really reach out through um, through phone, whatever that looks like, it's meeting families where they're at to, to uh, meet their needs. Second, supporting virtual or remote learning by promoting digital communication and literacy, ensuring students have access to devices and broadband internet were certainly um, the first steps in, um, in encouraging students to remain engaged during COVID um, through online learning. But digital, um, digital learning is not going away. And so how can schools implement um, those ideas and their family engagement plans to ensure that all students are connected properly um, and have the know-how to, to navigate those online platforms. And then third, um, another strategy would be to utilize these engagement plans to not just evaluate the academic uh, engagement or the cognitive engagement of students, but the emotional and behavioral um, well-being and engagement of students so we can really understand what um, what barriers schools need to address in helping students to remain connected to their learning. And then fourth here, establishing regular meetings with families, students, and other interested community members throughout the school year regarding the development and implementation of engagement plans. So as I mentioned before, nothing for the students except by the students, and this is really important, right, is, is encouraging not just your students, um, but your families and your community members at large to really engage in the designing of these plans. What issues are important to them and how can we help bridge solutions um, to addressing those concerns. And before I go on to the next slide, I do wanna invite either Olivia or Thomas to share in on some experiences they might've had with each of these strategies or other tips um, that are rel related to these. For sure, I'll go ahead and jump in and really speak towards the digital communication and digital literacy piece. Uh, 
a big part of the fuse between digital inclusion and student and family engagement is really speaking towards how can school districts provide an intergenerational connection for our students and families. We understand that um, when the COVID-19 pandemic began, the onset of hotspots and different Wi-Fi enabled tools were being able to be dispersed towards students, which was a really great fix at the time. Um, but we've now noticed that a lot of those devices aren't able to have the capabilities to have a lot of these two-way communication systems that we would need. And because of that, um, we also see families wanting to be involved in their internet. We also know that every family and every community and school is unique. Um, and so we need to be able to meet the needs of an intergenerational um, connection. So in practical sense, some of that looks like how can we advocate for really faster or higher internet speeds um, for our devices that we give towards students. Um, devices that don't block certain websites so we're able to have um, families be able to apply for SNAP benefits or government assistant things that may be blocked on a right, traditional school website, but how can we create this system where we're speaking towards not only our students but our families as well. Um, I think those are some practical tips and ways that we're able to implement things like this on a, on a district level. Um, and these are some of the research things that we've been talking about over the, the course of our nine months. And so really would like to see um, some districts be able to take some of this on. Thank you so much, Thomas, for talking more about the digital equity points to these engagement plans. Um, and that's really where a lot of what we mean about engaging students and their families and other community community members regularly so that school districts understand the issues that are, are affecting their communities um, so that these these um, solutions are informed and that they're not just band-aid fixes um, to an issue, but they are really addressing uh, the inequity of the of the issue. So I'll kind of move on to a few more um, strategies that you can implement in student and family engagement plans. The fifth, including programs and interventions that engage a family in supporting a student's learning at home. So partially what Thomas was uh, was talking about was having that access um, to networks and a computer and an internet service at home, um, knowing that a lot of an issue, an access issue is the homework gap, students not having a device or adequate connection at home. And uh, so engagement plans really should think about adding those um, those um, questions and room for solutions to their engagement plans. Uh, sixth, include programming that is accessible by families of emergent bilingual students. This is very important. Um, there is great research done by our fellow fellow, Araceli Garcia, who worked on emergent bilingual issues throughout our fellowship that are accessible through our IDRA site. But what I'll say here is that um, families of emergent bilinguals, especially here in Texas, are very underrepresented and often are um, are not acknowledged in this um, in this effort to engage them at the school level, but they definitely represent a huge student population. Um, and it is an important that it, programming can be accessed by these families so that they are staying connected to their um, students education. And then seventh, uh, lastly, demonstrate efforts to build sustainable solutions toward nurturing long lasting intergenerational relationships between school districts and families, which is what Thomas mentioned um, in, in his uh, recommendations. So I uh, will kind of open it up to either Thomas or Malivia again, if you had anything to add. If not, um, please, uh, I invite you to use the Q&A function, to ask us any um, questions, any lingering thoughts you may have about um, our presentation today. But first, Thomas or Olivia, would you like to add anything um, rel related to these points? Yeah, I think it's just really important that we're ensuring that every plan would look unique um, in a models like this. And of course, models are able to inform a lot of the practices that we do, um, but it's just not based on things. There are, of course, very unique needs that every single school district will have. So just being able to take different models like this and attempt to implement different strategies, I think, is a, a really good starting point um, that we can take as well. Um, and we do have a question um, from Lakeisha in the chat or a comment. Is there someone you can contact directly from your organization regarding the Crown Act? Yes, we've had um, one of our fellow fellows, Dr. Althea Caldera, work on testimony towards the Crown Act. We also have a Black student policy agenda as well that we can drop in the chat to be able to get you connected. Um, and I can drop my email as well so we can be able to have some more conversations on that. That's definitely something that we've researched over the past is the disciplinary actions um, taken against Black girls um, and Black students in general. Um, and so we'd love to follow. 
Um, yeah, that's all I've got. See you. Awesome. So I, again, just want to um, reiterate the fact that we don't have to wait uh, for our state leadership to um, lead these efforts. You know, school districts really have the power and the know-how and the expertise and the support to implement such strategies. And as Thomas mentioned, this just serves as a basic framework and really um, serves to be, uh, you know, it serves to be uh, just a way for school districts to start thinking about how to implement such strategies. You know, it's it's really designed so that um, school districts can meet and address those unique needs, as Thomas mentioned. So um, definitely um, want to share some resources here. So IDRA actually has um, a hub called Learning Goes On that serves kind of um, as a main place for materials, webinars, other information about resources um, that are related to these issues here um, and related to COVID-19 that ensures families and educators can best support students learning. So I definitely um, uh, recommend you check these out. And then of course, stay tuned to policy. Um, you know, IDRA does post some really great community tools and education um, tools for um, not just community members, but students, educators to really stay up to date with any policy or legislative um, happenings. And so um, definitely be on the lookout for those posted to the site soon. Uh, yes, and Thomas and I are dropping our information or emails down below in the chat. Please feel free to reach out to us. Um, with any other questions or if we can connect you to other resources um, on our team or at IDRA, we are more than happy to do so. Uh, but we can kind of wait and, and kind of present our Q&A for just a few minutes. I think we've also got a question in the chat that we can go up to from Sherry. Um, thanks so much for asking us a question. Could you all share any examples of successful models for engaging underrepresented families? And I guess kind of what is that? Definitely. So I actually do want to uplift a school district here in Texas, um, Far San Juan um, Alamo, PSJA school district that worked really closely with IDRA on something similar to our family engagement models. Um, and a lot of it looks like inviting community experts to be involved in these processes, connecting students to community um, experts that are of fields of interest for students. Um, and it gives students a, a better idea of what opportunities they have following high school. But also they, the, the communities are invested in our schools. And I think that's what's really great about their particular model is that it is designed in such a way that makes um, makes engaging students and their families a community effort. Um, and definitely wanna point out that PSJ serves a, a very large population of emergent bilingual students and Latinx families. Uh, so yes, Sherry, I, I did want to uplift that particular school district. But again, there are, are many districts, um, not just in Texas, um, that have really robust engagement models that we are really excited to share more about um, as this research continues ongoing. But of course, uh, definitely want to ensure that students are a part of this process um, because they actually have a lot of great solutions and what it means to engage them in, the, in their student advocacy initiatives. Thank you so much for that question. Uh, we have another question here from Edward Gallegos. How critical is it for students and families to not only understand their responsibilities as students, but to actually sign a learning contract that specifies what they are responsible for? Yeah, I, I think that's a really great question um, to think about um, how critical it is for students and families to understand what's going on in the, in the classroom. I know from a policy perspective, this has made a lot of news in the headlines. Here in Texas, we've seen a lot of these anti-critical race theory things and things like that come up a part of our curriculum. Um, and it's it's really a harmful thing that a lot of Texas, a lot of um, state legislators, not only in Texas, are attempting to almost rewrite curriculums, a part of that. And so students are being left out of a lot of these conversations, um, as well as the families. And so we've heard from a myriad of students that have provided testimony. Um, as well as families that are very concerned about a lot of these things that are being taught in the classroom that they know are really helpful towards students. We know things like ethnic studies um, and, and being able to learn about the history of race and different relations are super important. That's just a couple of examples, um, as well as many other things that students and families want to be involved in their education. Um, I think we've kind of dispelled the myth and assumption 
that families and parents don't want to be involved. I think schools just don't always make it necessarily the easiest um, to do that and don't provide some of those meeting meetings people where they are type things. And so it's depending on what time you're having a meeting. Um, not everyone's able to attend that if you're going to do it virtual or online. Um, not everyone has that access. Um, so I think it's super critical, um, Edward, to answer your question to 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 have some of those conversations and to make sure that students are, are at the center of it. We need to go as far as students writing their own curriculum. I think if we really want to be sure um, that we're creating places that are just as filled and equitable, um, I think that's the approach we want to go towards. And there's a lot of research on community schools and things like that that are kind of walking towards more of that. Um, but it is it's very critical for families and students to be part of that process. Yeah, and I want to add, you know, to your point, Thomas, about just getting students and families involved in the first place so that they do understand what um, rights and responsibilities that they have at their um, discretion, right? And it's it's about engaging them in the first place and, and operating from a space of inclusion um, and acceptance and acknowledgement of a student's and family's concerns. Uh, so I think to your point, um, Mr. Gayo, Mr. Gayo, because as your um, as a student and, and a family member or even a community member at that at that point, it's what options do I have? And um, that goes back to our, our point about schools and school districts making it a two way communication system and making um, meetings not happen just as Thomas mentioned at very specific times or as very specific places that are, maybe are inaccessible to most families, um, but creating spaces where um, more more families can get involved, more community members can get involved, more students can get involved. So there is a better understanding of where our rights and responsibilities lie um, and where our safeguards for students specifically are. So thank you for your question. I also so to help. Oh, I'm so sorry. Go ahead, Thomas. Oh, no, yeah, I was just going to hop over, like you were saying, to the Q&A section and yes. just some of the questions that we have in there. Um, so Laura Chris Green um, brings this question, research on instructional Technology equity has repeatedly shown that inequities exist with regards to access to the internet and hardware. But of equal importance is the fact that the ways instructional technologies are delivered to marginalized students, yes. such as emergent bilinguals, are equitably done. So I guess kind of speaking towards what does that process look like and why is it so important um, that we're able to um, roll that the rollout process of things and more speaking towards how we deliver that technology. And you could speak to some of the digital literacy skills that are important as well. Definitely. And um, I think this is a really important point is thinking about the way um, these services are even offered in the first place. And so I, I did want to mention that in our morning presentation about digital equity, um, we previewed some of the solutions in that. Um, I know that IDRA um, EAC South is considering um, deeply about digital equity audits. And in part of that is the instructional technology programs, um, accessibility and, and equitable, equitability. So I did wanna point out that there are um, some solutions being crafted um, that really do speak to that, that inequitable delivery of such services, particularly as it pertains to emergent bilingual students. So thank you so much for that question. Let's see, I did see a few more questions in the chat. How can we increase trust and build positive relationships between teachers and caregivers while acknowledging the historical trauma that has existed between these two parties? This is a very critical question. And I really want to invite Malivia, if you can, um, to talk about this um, and also Thomas. Um, my biggest thing is that you have to research and realize what demographic, what type of students you're working with, what type, what your district looks like. A lot of people, I know from experience, because my mother worked at a school, that many teachers come from other cities or other districts to work in whatever dis district they're working at. And they don't really have a concept of what that area looks like and what that demographic looks like. So I think it's very important for students 
uh, for I'm sorry, for teachers and administration to realize what their surrounding community looks like in reality, not just something as you pass by to get to work and you just see what you're seeing in this in the classroom. I think it's very important to go outside the classroom and realize what kind of community you are teaching, what are they lacking so you can bring that into the classroom without having to, you know, pressure students into ask, answering questions that maybe they don't want to answer. But then again, you could always create a safe space to have these students to bring up their concerns or what they think they're lacking. Yeah, and I will point out too, um, in that and related to that is in conversations with you know community members, educators, students, particularly. Um, that was a big that was a big barrier. Is that we don't trust our our school leaders. We don't trust our school district to take care or address our concerns and issues. Um, and so yeah, this trust does not happen overnight. And, and that's kind of the point of these engagement plans is having a plan, having a framework that holds the. Um, school districts or school leaders accountable that we can all agree upon um, that helps to sustain and build that trust um, because that is really critical. If there's no trust, um, it will be very hard to, to do any type of work or find any type of solutions to families' concerns or um, challenges that students may face in their own learning. So um, thank you for that question. I think that's a really critical point to this. Um, I'll go ahead and check the Q&A. Uh, I know we're at time, but I thank you again for um, joining this space and presentation. Again, this is not the one and done conversation to these um, in really important and critical engagement strategies that we should all consider. Um, so thank you so much for spending time and sharing those really uh, thoughtful ideas. Uh, any last minute comments, Thomas or Olivia? You can go ahead, Olivia. Oh, um, if you need to reach out to us, uh, our emails are in the chat. So please be, please feel free to uh, email us any questions or concerns you have about particular situations within your school district or your community, and we'll be more than gladly to answer and help you give uh, examples on what you can do to improve that. For sure, yeah. Just what Olivia is saying. IDRA has a really great, really great house of resources that we that we work on a lot of research briefs that i've talked about a lot of these different things whether we're talking about racial equity and addressing some of these really hard conversations um, that we're having in schools and, and working towards justice and so we feel free to visit our website or look at any of the policy briefs or things that we've also worked on um, throughout the legislative session and ways that we're able to um, even partner with different organizations here in texas and even all throughout the ex south region um, we'd be more than happy to Thank you again for sharing your afternoon. And as you know, the presentations will be recorded and the digital equity uh, recording is one I really hope you take a look at. Um, it talks a little bit more about some of the systemic uh, inequities that students and their families experience as it relates to uh, digital connectivity. Thank you so much, everyone. You have a great rest of your afternoon.